Hello everybody and welcome to London for yet another episode of Anubhuti. And today we are going to talk with you about some of the facts about London. As you know, London is a city which is full of facts and there are many facts which are not that well known to most people. So out of so many of these uh, lesser known facts, we have picked five such lesser known facts for you which we are going to tell you about. We are not only going to tell you about these lesser known facts, but we are going to show you the places which are associated with these facts. So today we are going to start the story with an area which is not too far away from where I'm standing. I'm talking about the East Cheap area in London. So we pick up the story from that location. And now I'm going to show you a statue. And this is a special statue, not an ordinary one. What I'm going to show you is what is claimed to be the smallest statue anywhere in the world. While I'm not sure about the authenticity of this claim, it seems that certainly in this part of the world, this appears to be the tiniest statue, the smallest statue. So before I tell you further about this statue, let's have a look at this statue. It's right behind me. As you can see there, you can see two mice fighting over a piece of cheese. And this statue is on the corner building on Philtop Lane, which is where I'm standing in the moment, in the East Chip area of London. And there's a very interesting story interesting but sad story behind it and i'll tell you the story now this was in the middle of the 19th century when during the construction of the building in this area it is said that two workers picked up a fight and the reason for that is that what one of the workers when he sat down for lunch on one of the days he discovered that his cheese sandwich was gone and he somehow thought that his colleague had stolen it so he picked up the fight with the colleague and the fight turned ugly and unfortunately, while fighting with each other, they fell from a height. And because of that fall, unfortunately, they both died. Later on, it was discovered that the real culprit was not the colleague of this guy. The real culprit were the mice who actually took the cheese sandwich away. So, in memory of those two workers who unfortunately died in this incident, which could have been avoided, this statue was installed here in the year 1862, which is a good 159 years back. So, an interesting but a sad story. And right now I'm standing in the upmarket area called Leinster Gardens in the city of London, not too far away from the famous Hyde Park. And as you can see, it's a, it's a beautiful area, one of the Tony areas of London with beautiful houses on either side of the road. But why am I here? I'm here because if I turn around, the two houses that you see behind the tree there, they look like the regular houses, but they are in fact fake houses. Or to put it correctly, what you see behind me, they are not houses, they're just the false facades. So behind these facades, just behind the trees, there are no houses. And the story goes like this that in 1860s, when London Underground was under construction from Paddington to Bayswater, the tunneling was not done by the real boring method. By real boring method, I mean that when you use a method to create the tunnels without disturbing the ground surface. Instead, much of the tunneling then was done by what is called the cut and cover method, in which you cut the ground surface open, put your structure, build your structure, including tunnels, and then cover it back. And that's how it was done. So obviously, many buildings which fell along the route of the underground section had to be raised, had to be demolished, and many of them were reconstructed, but not all of them. The two houses behind me are an example of the buildings which were never constructed. Instead, a hole was left in this place because these tunnels need ventilation. So at regular intervals, one has to provide the ventilation shafts or the vertical tunnels. So this was the area just behind me where this big hole was put as a ventilation shaft. And so this hole in the middle of this upmarket area was an eyesore. So to cover the wound, it was decided to build these false facades so that they look like regular houses. And there are people who have been living in this area for years and they don't know that these are not the real houses. 
Instead, they are false facades. They have done a very nice job with minute details. But if you look closely, you will find that the windows, they do not have glasses. They are painted upon. The real thing is revealed when you go to the back side of these, these facades. And I'm going to take you to the back and you will see what I mean by the ventilation shaft and what is this facade trying to cover. Give me a moment and I'll take you to the back of these facades. And now I am at the back of those facades which you saw from the front and what you see now reveals the whole story. You can clearly see the ventilation shaft going down and the walls of those shafts, as you would imagine, have been supported by these steel struts which are going across the opening, the vertical shaft, which is left there for the purpose of ventilating the tunnels. So the tunnel which was constructed from Paddington to Bayswater, this was the ventilation shaft and from the front of it, it appeared like a hole which affected the beauty of the area and that's why as I mentioned, those facades were created. So from the front, they look like regular houses. But when you come to the back side of it, you see the real story. And right now I'm standing at a place which is one of the most visited places in London by tourists who want to take a selfie with the the Houses of Parliament and the Big Ben in the background. The tower that you see behind me, that is called the Big Ben. But the problem is that no tourist ever leaves with the selfie with the Big Ben. And the reason for that is, and it's a little lesser known fact, that the tower behind me, which is actually known as Big Ben, is in fact the Elizabeth Tower. Big Ben is the name of the clock, or to be more precise, the bell which resides inside that tower. So you can never perhaps take a selfie with the Big Ben itself, but if you're lucky, perhaps you can hear the sound of the Big Ben. Here it is. I'm sure you caught that that was a recorded sound because unfortunately the Big Ben isn't bonging these days. Since 2017, it's encased in the scaffolding, it's under repair, it's under renovation. And it is expected to be fully fit to bong again in next few months. And then we'll be able to hear its sweet sound all over again. But till then, or even after that, any selfie, anything that you take is not with the Big Ben. It is with the Elizabeth Tower. All of us know that in Britain, they drive on the left-hand side. But the place I'm standing on at the moment, this road, this small street called Savoy Court, is the only street in the UK, in London, where you're required by law to drive on the right-hand side. As you can see, I'll show you that. In fact, this street is just uh, off the strand, and that's strand behind me, and I'll take you there to show the signages on the road. As you can see behind me, there are not too many cars now, but uh, once I reach here, if you look down, you can see on the right hand side, it's written out and on the left hand side, it is in. So you enter this street driving on the right hand side this was decided by, by an act of parliament more than 100 years back. And the reason, there are a few reasons behind it. The stories go like this. One of the stories is about the iconic Savoy Hotel, which you see behind me. Please read about Savoy Hotel and see how iconic it really is. Now, if you drive on the left-hand side like that, and back then, the dignitaries and ladies were taking the horse-driven carriage to go to Hotel Savoy. And uh, if you were driving on the left hand side, the carriage would stop in such a way in front of the hotel gate that the right hand side of the carriage would be away from the entrance to the hotel. So it was customary for the lady or the dignitary to alight from the right hand side after the doorman or the driver opens the gate, opens the door of the carriage. And so this was not considered appropriate for the dignitary or the lady to go around the vehicle, around the carriage, to enter the hotel. So, but if you're driving on the right-hand side, that's just behind me, 
you're driving and when you reach the hotel entrance the entrance would be on the right so the dignitary or the lady can alight from that side and straight away enter the hotel another reason is about the savoy theater another iconic feature of london you can see savoy theater behind me there just on the left of the savoy hotel now people who are visiting the theater to watch a show and coming by taxis if they were, if the taxis were driving on the left hand side they will all queue up in such a way that they might block the entrance to Savoy Hotel. So to avoid that, the taxis enter the right hand side and they queue up like this and not blocking the entrance to the hotel. Yet another reason is that uh, when the taxis, they drop off their passengers coming to the theater, driving on the right hand side, after dropping off their passengers, they continue driving and pass in front of the Savoy Hotel and that's how they have another opportunity to pick up some more passengers from the hotel if they are waiting there for them. But if you were to drive on the left hand side where I'm standing, you would pass the hotel first and then drop the passengers off at the theater. So after dropping them off at the Savoy Theater, the taxis do not have an opportunity to pick up any waiting passengers from the entrance of the Savoy Hotel. So how interesting is this? This is the only street in the whole of UK where you require to drive by law on the right hand side. As you can see this car waiting to cross the street, driving on the right hand side just behind me. And to continue to show you some of the lesser known facts about London, I'm standing right now as you can see behind me on Pudding Lane. Pudding Lane has a very strong historic connection. It was here on that September night in 1666 that a fire started. It turned into the Great Fire of London, which swept through major parts of the London, destroying one fourth of the city. It destroyed more than 13,000 homes, several churches, more than 80 churches, damaged the St. Paul Cathedral, destroyed many government buildings and rendered close to 100,000 people homeless. That fire started in a bakery just after midnight on Sunday the 2nd September and raged for four days and four nights helped by a strong wind that was blowing from the east in this area. So what is the interesting or lesser known fact that I'm going to tell you about it? I'll tell that fact in a bit but uh, before that, I'm going to show you something which was built to commemorate that fire. And the structure that I'm going to show you is the monument of fire. Give me a moment. So I'm standing, as I said, on Pudding Lane. And if I turn around and show you the monument I was talking about, that's the monument to commemorate the great fire of the September of 1666. This monument was built between 1671 and 1677 to also celebrate the rebuilding of the city of London. So the lesser known fact about this that I was going to share with you, now is the time to tell you about that. You heard about the devastating nature of the fire. It is so much part of the London history that fire changed London forever. London was quickly depopulated, people ran away from the city and London was left after a fire in a state where it was not recognizable. In fact, there were people who were living in London, grew up in London for many years and after the fire, many of them just couldn't recognize the names of the streets. It was difficult for them to find out which street they're standing on. The condition was that bad. And of course, many people must have died. And here's the interesting fact that I was going to share with you. Despite this devastating catastrophe, according to the official records, only six people lost their lives in the Great Fire of London. This is incredible. This is unbelievable, but this is true. Only six people lost their lives according to official records. The experts point out that the reason for that could be that many bodies were actually charred and the fire which continued for four days and four nights must have burnt many dead bodies completely in such a way that they were not recognizable or there were no remains of those bodies. Whatever be the reason, this remains a fact that 
despite this huge fire, only six official deaths occurred. So that's all we have for you today. And I hope you enjoyed the show. And thank you very much for being on Anubhuti. And I hope you will continue to support this effort. So till we meet again in the next episode, which is only a few days away, it's uh, bye bye from my side, Banuj Burman signing off from London. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.